Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, uh, IPsec encapsulation over TCP. Uh, first, I will give a small introduction. Um, some reminders in case you've not, you're not completely familiar with IPsec. And um, then I will describe what this protocol looks like. And um, then I will talk about the Linux implementation I'm proposing. And uh, what it looks like from the user space point of view. Uh, I don't have anything to do with uh, the creation of this standard. I'm just uh, describing it and implementing it. So first, uh, introduction. Um, IPsec is a um, protocol suite that has three components, one of which I'm not going to talk about after this introduction. So there's ESP, that's the encapsulating security payload. That's what carries the, the data that you, want, that you want to protect. Uh, authentication, header, it, we're not going to talk about it, that's it. And Ike is the key exchange mechanism that uh, sets up the, the ESP association. So the packet format for ESP is just a ESP header over IP and then you've got your encrypted data. And for Ike, uh, it, goes over <coughs> it goes over UDP port 500 and it's an IP, so IP UDP header and then you get the Ike header and the Ike payload. Uh, then, because of NAT, they had to come up with UDP encapsulation because NAT needs the ports to need some ports to demultiplex between the internal IP addresses and the external IP address. So um, they used uh, UDP port 4500 for that, and it's using only one port for both ESP and I traffic. Everything goes over a single port. Um, so you get the UDP header, then um, comes the ESP header, which is composed of the SPI and the sequence number, and then there's the encrypted data like we had with uh, raw, U raw ESP. And when Ike is transported over UDP port 4500, uh, they add this, this zero that you can see there, and that's called the non-ESP marker, and it's used to differentiate if what comes after the UDP header is Ike or ESP. If the four bytes after the UDP header are zero, then it's Ike, and it goes to the Ike daemon in user space. Otherwise, if it's not zero, then it's the SPI, and that's used by the ESP implementation. But that's not the end of middle box trouble. Uh, unfortunately, apparently, there are middle boxes that don't want anything other than TCP. I'm not saying it's a good thing and that we should indulge them, but it's a reality. So there comes TCP encapsulation for, for IPsec. So that's a standout from a year and a half ago, I think. So what does the TCP stream look like when you're using this RFC? So you open your TCP connection to the, to the Ike, Ike daemon and you have your TCP stream and you're going to just concatenate one message after the other. So each message starts with a two byte length field. Yeah, that tells you what the full length of the upcoming message is. Then it's pretty much the same format as for UDP encapsulation. There's a ESP header that starts with the SPI and then the sequence number. And after that come the, comes the encrypted data. The message format for Ike is pretty similar. There's the length field. Then there's this non-ESP marker that's used in the same way as for UDP encapsulation. And then comes the Ike message. So, uh, in generic terms for, the, for how the protocol behaves, uh, the sender is going to 
take its messages, whether IC or ESP, at the length prefix, which is those two bytes. And for IC messages, it needs to add this non-ESP marker as well, just like it did for UDP encapsulation. And then it pushes all those messages, one after the other, down the TCP socket. On the receive side, the, so the receiver needs to pass the TCP stream to extract all those messages from the stream. And that's why we need the length field so that you can recognize each message out of the stream. And once you've extracted a message from the stream, uh, you differentiate ESP from IC using the SPI or the non-ESP marker at the beginning of the message, and then handle the message. If it's ESP, it goes uh, through the ESP implementation, otherwise it's passed to the IC daemon. So the Linux implementation I've been working on is based on something that Herbert Ksu posted to the NetDev mailing list about a year ago. Uh, it was not accepted because he was modifying the TCP implementation and adding some hooks in there which uh, the people who care about performance were not happy with. I can understand that. So I'm, I'm modifying it so that it doesn't do any of that and just limits itself to the TCP stack, or to the, sorry, the IPsec implementation in the kernel and uh, reuses some existing infrastructure that facilitates implementing this kind of protocol in the kernel. So first of all, we have, in the Linux kernel, we have XFRM, which is the infrastructure that's underneath the kernel's IPsec implementation, and it just takes packets and can apply all kinds of transformation to it. In the case of ESP, it adds, some, it adds the ESP header and encrypts the packet. Um, then we have the upper layer protocol infrastructure, TCP ULP, and it's used to implement internal protocols on top of TCP. Uh, for example, that's what the KTLS implementation uses. So we have a data path for TLS in the kernel, and it's implemented using ULP. So what ULP does is um, lets the user space application provide this set socket, the TCP ULP set socket, and that triggers an init callback inside the kernel that can be used by your uh, in-kernel implementation of the protocol to do whatever initialization it needs to do. Uh, for example, it can be used to replace some of the socket operations with whatever extensions are needed for the protocol, adding some header, encrypting, all those kinds of things. So that means that um, when you will invoke the send syscall from user space, for example, it will, instead of going through the TCP send, it will go through some protocol specific variant. Uh, the next piece of infrastructure that the kernel provides is the stream parser. It's a framework that's used to pass messages out of a TCP stream. Uh, that's also used by KTLS. And uh, what, a, what a module that uses stream parser does is it, you have two callbacks. Uh, one is the pass message callback that reads some data out of the TCP stream and returns the length of the next message. And then you got the receive message callback that processes the message in whatever <coughs> ways is fit for this protocol. And the stream parser has a, the, um, the infrastructure itself has a receive function that's triggered when new data arrives on the TCP socket and that will call the pass message and receive message operations from the specific module or the specific protocol you're developing. So a quick overview of the overall implementation. It uses ULP um, to initialize the stream parser that will run on the TCP socket. And it also redefines a few of the socket operations. For example, the send message and receive message are modified to do the um, encapsulation with the length header. And on the receive side, it uses a stream parser to extract messages 
uh, when the message is Ike, it will go to user space via the receive syscall. And if it's ESP, it will go through the IPsec implementation in the kernel. So the, on the receive side, uh, when data arrives on the encapsulation socket, it goes through the stream, through stream parcels receive function, which is global underscore strp receive, which will call the, the encapsulation, the ESP encapsulation pass message and receive message implementations. Uh, the pass message implementation just reads the first two bytes out of, out of the message, out of the TCP stream at the current offset, and that's the length field. And then the so the stream parser with the stream parser uh, core implementation will extract that many bytes out of the stream and pass it to the receive message callback. And a receive message will read the first four bytes. If it's zero, then it's an ESP marker and it will um, process the message as I. If it's not zero, then it's an SPI and it passes the, it continues processing as ESP. ESP messages will go through the normal XFRM path, like, like for example with UDP encapsulation or with no encapsulation at all, and the message will be decrypted, verified, and so on, and then it gets passed, if it's correct, then it gets passed to the rest of the networking stack. Otherwise, if it detects an Ike message, uh, then it's put on a separate user space queue, and there's an there's the receive message in kernel implementation that will pass that to the receive syscall that user space can invoke. On the transmit side, um, we've got two source of messages. There's the Ike daemon that will use the send syscall as, would, as it would on the, on the UDP socket. That's almost entirely transparent. And in the kernel, when you call, when you invoke the send syscall, it will call the uh, send message implementation, which will add the length prefix and enqueue that message to the TCP socket. Otherwise, data packets that come from the IP stack will go through XFRM, get uh, processed as transformed into ESP messages, uh, which get the length prefix added in front and then that's also enqueued to the TCP socket. Uh, one interesting problem with implementing that kind of protocol, or that kind of message-based protocol on top of TCP, is avoiding interleaving of messages, which, is, um, which would actually break the TCP stream. So if you start sending a message, but you cannot push the entire message down the TCP socket because there's not enough space on the TCP socket, um, then you will have only those first n bytes of the message that are sent on the TCP socket. If you try sending, if you don't remember that and if you don't finish sending that message at this point in the stream, you start sending a message to at this point, then, um, Where you would expect, uh, here you would expect to have the, leg, the next length field because, yeah, that's the full length of message one. So at this point, the stream parser expects here there's a next, the next message is starting. But if the next message is starting here, then here there's only garbage instead of having the length of a message. So your stream is broken and you will not be able to recover any message anymore, except if you get lucky. But don't hope for that. So the way to avoid interleaving of messages on the stream is if you cannot push the entire message down the TCP socket, you remember that you only sent part of it and at the next occasion when there's room on the TCP socket, then you push the rest of that message from where you stopped and then you can send more messages afterwards. That's uh, exactly what TLS is doing already, and I'm using the same solution here. So what does um, ESP and TCP look like from a user space point of view? Uh, there, are two, there are two components. One is creating the XFRM states. Um, I'm 
a kernel person, so I use IPXFRM. Uh, user space people probably use Netlink directly with the NLA NCAP option. But essentially, it's the same as UDP encapsulation with just replacement of, oops, with just, just replacing UDP with ESP and TCP instead. And uh, that's pretty much it. You create your XFRM states with the, with the ESP and TCP encapsulation. And it's, yeah, that's it. Uh, the other component is a user space program that will typically be the Ike daemon, but for testing I'm using something much smaller, which is just yeah, a few lines of code. So you open a, you you need to open your TCP encapsulation socket from user space. Um, these po these XFRM policies are so that the routing lockup doesn't take your the packets from the TCP encapsulation and make them go back into XFRM so that they would themselves be encrypted again, and then packets don't go out. So this, the, um, the TCP encapsulation socket needs to bypass ESP itself. <coughs> so you need to connect your TCP socket to the server. And then, uh, yeah, one thing I didn't mention is that the client um, the client for the the client socket on the TCP for the TCP encapsulation needs to start its stream with the with the Ike TCP string to tell the server, hey, this is this is actually encapsulation. It's not just a random connection coming in, and then you will have just garbage coming on that socket. So. With this, with this string prefix, you tell the Ike daemon, hey, this is, this is indeed a TCP encapsulation of ESP and Ike, so keep going. So that's, that message is being sent by user space, and then uh, you set the, you enable the ESP encapsulation on that socket with the ULP framework, and then that socket is ready to be used for ESP and Ike. Uh, I didn't. I don't have a slide with a server-side program, but it's pretty similar. It, you do accept, and then you you accept the incoming socket, and then uh, enable the encapsulation as well. So the socket behavior. Uh, it's a GCP socket, but in the end, it behaves like a UDP socket once you've enabled the encapsulation. So, yeah. The, the kernel will add the length prefix for the Ike messages. You don't have to do that in user space. But user space will take care of the non-ESP marker. Uh, that's what the existing UDP encapsulation is doing. So for consistency, I'm also letting user space do that. Uh, that's something we discussed with the liberal swan and strong swan developers. They preferred it that way. So there's this Ike TCP prefix that's written by user space before enabling the encapsulation. And on the server side, the server needs to read that just after accepting the incoming connection. And if this prefix doesn't come, then the server should just close the connection because it's not an, encap an incoming encapsulation request. If the prefix is here, then the server just takes the connection in and enables the encapsulation as well. So yeah, I was saying it behaves like a UDP socket, which means that uh, for one send, one Ike message will go out. And I haven't implemented message more or anything like that. It's just simple. If somebody needs it, then maybe, but I don't really see the point at the moment. And on the receive side, one run receive syscall will get one full Ike message from the socket. If the receive buffer is too small, then the rest of the message will be dropped. That's also what UDP does. And uh, the, mes the message peak flag will just return the first end bytes. I'm not implementing picking offset. That's unnecessary complexity, I think, at this point. And yeah, it returns the first the first bytes of the first message. 
So a few words to finish. Um, there's a bit of remaining work. Uh, at the IPSec workshop earlier this week, we discussed a possible starvation issue. If you have an yes, if you have ESP flooding the socket, then maybe your IP messages could get starved. Um, I haven't tested that yet, so I don't have a I don't have a solution for that if it happens. And um, I haven't done any testing with the IP daemon because. Uh, the implementations was not the implementations were not public yet, but that's something we will do as soon as we share each other's code. And if that testing goes well, then I will go upstream, post that on NetDev, and that's it for me. Any questions? Hi. Impressive, oh, yeah. impressive work. Um, I have a question about the size of the packet that are sent uh, typically by XFRM to, uh, to, to this layer. Be because I guess X with UDP we try to send MTU size packet, so that might be not very optimal if you have a TCP transport. Yeah, so that's uh, something I haven't dealt much with. That, uh, in XFRM you have a way to say what the MTU will be for the route that goes through XFRM. Um, that yeah, that could be uh, MTU on on that route could be very big, yeah. like a full a and full message. My second question was about zero copy um, because it seems that you have a queue of packet to be sent uh, to this TCP uh, layer because you need to eventually have a partial write and you need to be able to send the remain, the remain of the packet. So maybe uh, zero copy could be used because you hold the packet in XFRM layer anyway. Uh, yeah, I haven't looked into zero copy for now. Because I think TLS might be using zero copy already. I have to um, double check. Could be, yeah. Hi, Sabrina. So it's oh. actually similar, Eric, to uh, RDS TCP. The mic is not working. Hi. Can, um. So I don't know the mic's on now. So it's actually similar to RDS TCP. There's um, the app, the user space sees a message mounted socket, and then it's broken up by the TCP layer just into segments. So if you wanted to use zero copy, you could do what we did for RDS, but you'd have to pin the message down until it was actually sent. And then when TCP finds the, yes, the act coming back saying the whole message was sent, you can unpin the message and free it. So you have a message bounded socket to be visible to the application, but underneath it's actually broken into TCP segments, right, MTU size segments. So the message has to be pinned down if you wanted to use zero copy. Look, right? Sorry. The whole message. So your message may be like say 8K bytes and it's broken into 1500 byte segments. Right? So you have to pin down the 8000 byte message until all 1500 times 5 or whatever segments are sent and act. Right? You could use zero copy down the road. But... Okay. I will look into it. Hi. Yeah. So the UDP uses two ports, right? Um, if you use uh, IPsec over UDP. Could you no? No, if you're using if you're using um, IPsec over UDP, then you will have only one port for both IC and ESP. That's why you need this non -E non ESP marker at the beginning of the IC message to differentiate them. Yeah, I was gonna say the TCP, the you know the starvation thing is because you're putting them on the same TCP stream. Could you know could you use two TCP streams, one for IC and one for yeah? Data? But in UDP, you don't really have a starvation right, problem, right? Right. Right. Because yeah. yeah. Oh, but so so yeah. could you split the t when you do TCP though? Could you just use two two TCP streams and then you don't have the starvation? You'd have to yeah. propose a new port, maybe I guess. <laughs> That's not what they decided in the RFC though. Yeah, you're, no, yeah, you'd have to revise it. Any other question? Uh, 
looking at the way the encapsulation is done, I think it doesn't seem to be really specific to uh, ICE and ESP. So maybe, did you think about the idea if it could be generalized to uh, encapsulate any UDP traffic into TCP to pass through networks which doesn't pass UDP? Uh, what did you say? I think we see RDSPs, we already do something similar. Okay. Say it in the mic. Repeat. Oh, I said KCM and RDS TCP already do that, so the concept is not new. Yeah, well, that's, yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs>